Welcome to the flipped lesson on Inside the Island and the Gothic Convention of the Return of the Repressed. This lesson will look at how the Gothic genre has changed to when the settlers came to Australia and has now become the Australian Gothic genre. As with all my flipped lessons, you may not share this video with anyone or pass the link on to anyone. This is the standard copyright notice. So we are going to talk about Inside the Island today and we are going to be looking at the return of the repressed. Neha, are you listening? Yes. So what we're going to talk about today looks at some of the things we've spoken already before we did the text and while we were reading the play. And we're going to bring a lot of those things together today and we're going to see how Inside the Island is a classic Gothic text, albeit an Australian Gothic text, but we're also going to have a teeny tiny look at Mr. Freud right at the end. So before we do anything, let's talk about what we are about the Australian Gothic <coughs> genre. Now, you know about the Gothic genre. You, when Australian settlers were first coming here, the Gothic genre had just exploded up in Britain. And we had that with books such as The Castle of Otranto. We had that with The Mysteries of Udolfo. We had that with Frankenstein, which you are going to study next year. We had that with Wuthering Heights. And we had that with Dracula. So when the first slate was coming over in the late 18th, in the late 18th century or late 1700s, for the next 100 years, the Gothic genre was very prominent in Europe. Now, you know what the Gothic genre is, right? But the difference is that in Europe and in Britain, the Gothic genre or the Gothic landscape was very different to what people experienced when they came here. You had old castles, you had cemeteries, you had uh, secret passages, graveyards, very traditionally haunted places such as these. In Australia, however, we don't have any of those things. We don't have old dilapidated castles. We don't have ancient passages that people can go on in one place and come out in another. We don't have any of those things. But those, the effects of the Gothic genre, which is what we have up here, are still there. Now, what are the effects of the Gothic genre? What are some of the important bits? Madness. There's madness, good, what else? Isolation. Try, try not to read that. Try and tell me yourself. Okay? What else do we have? Suspense. Suspense. There's a fear of something. There's a, a supernatural element. Isolation. A sense of the uncanny. Uh, there is um, a damsel in distress at times. Sasha, what was that? Return of the, repressed. the return of the repressed as well. So we have a lot of the elements of the Gothic genre and what we're going to see is how we can translate them to something that is a uniquely Australian Gothic genre. Now, before the, Brit before the British even came here, Australia already had a reputation. <coughs> and it was for this weird place, a grotesque space, a land peopled by monsters. It was a dungeon of the world, a world of reversals, the dark subconscious of Britain. So it was already a place which had a hold in people's imagination as this strange, uncanny, uh, derelict, isolated place which was not normal for the British in any sense of the word. So there, there was already a reputation. So when people actually came here, they actually found that what the Australia they had imagined was pretty much the Australia that they got. So when the first fleet came here in 1788, how did they experience Australia? What was so unique about Australia for them? Well, for one thing, the landscape was very different. We didn't have the traditional castles and things. The seasons were completely reversed. So when it's supposed to be hot in the rest of the world, in the civilized world, it was cold in Australia and vice versa. So the seasons were reversed. Even the color green and the types of trees were very different. Notice the very British trees here and the very Australian trees and the colour green and the landscape over there. So everything was extremely different for them and they'd never seen anything like it. So it became something of a shock, a cultural shock for them. Can you see that, Monique? Yeah. Look at a typical British oak tree. 
look at the tree trunk and compare it to a gum tree which sheds its bark. This is something very different for them. They weren't used to it. The traditional white swan was the black swan. There were no storied windows, no ruins. The ivy green subterranean passage or such like relics of feudal barons. There was nothing that they were accustomed to. This was a land unexplored, undiscovered, as you can see here. Look at the differences in landscape. So we've got a very British landscape there and there, and a stark contrast in the Australian landscape. So someone coming from one of these places, who was only used to that kind of landscape, to come here, it's somewhere that the mind couldn't fathom. Not only was it a hellish place and atmosphere, but it was something where everything was completely subverted and just wrong. Look at the animals of Australia, dangerous, terrifying things. Not the typical foxes and uh, rabbits that you would have in England, but terrifying animals, very dangerous animals. The weather. Imagine coming from Britain where summer is what, a heat wave is what, two days of 30 degrees, to our summers here. And not just summers on the coast, but summers in the interior of Australia. Everything was wrong here. Nothing was right in Australia. And then the clothes they had to wear, stifling heat in the centre of Australia, wearing traditional European clothes, as you saw in Picnic at Hanging Rock. So nothing was right in this vast, barren, hot, hot land. And so, we have the fundamental difference between the two kinds of Gothic, tradi traditional Gothic and Australian Gothic, and that is the landscape. The landscape of British Gothic was very different to the landscape that they found when they came to Australia. And in Australian Gothic, because of the isolation they felt, trapped in the middle of nowhere, it was as if the landscape itself took on a supernatural course. It became this thing to fear, We can see that when we saw Picnic at Hanging Rock. It's the landscape, it's the, hanging, it's the rock which draws the girls to them and takes them to their depths and to their madness. All of these are very much part of the Gothic tradition. It's just used differently in Australian Gothic, as you already know from our discussion before we read the play. Even in The Drover's Wife, which you would have read in Year 9, bush all around, bush with no horizon for the country is flat. No ranges in the distance. The bush consists of stunted, rotten native apple trees. Notice the emphasis on stunted, rotten native apple trees. Does that remind you of inside the island? Mm -hmm. Becomes important. No undergrowth. Nothing to relieve the eye save the darker green of a few she-oaks which are sighing above the narrow, almost waterless creek. <coughs> and even the darker green, it's not like the fresh green of Britain. 19 miles to the nearest sign of civilization, a shanty on the main road. That's how isolated they were, and they felt it. So, the vast mysterious presence of the Gothic was also the vast mysterious presence of the Australian landscape. And so, it was a grotesque perversion of what they were familiar with. And don't forget, the grotesque and the perverted are both um, elements of the Gothic genre as well. So what was familiar for them, a tree perhaps, a swan perhaps, was in a very unfamiliar landscape and setting and that unsettled them, that made them uncomfortable. And so that what was familiar had become unfamiliar because it had been transformed into an unfamiliar space. So it was very discombobulating, disorienting and ultimately very disempowering for them. And the reason I've got disempowering for them there is because <coughs> it is for this reason that Australian Gothic literature is very often used as a post-colonial comment. Inside the Island is a post-colonial text and it uses the Gothic genre to make a comment about colonization. And that is one of the things that we're going to be looking at today. How the Gothic genre and specifically the return of the repressed how they are making a comment about colonization. And not just a neutral comment, it's a harsh indictment 
of the British colonization of Australia. And you will have seen this as we have been reading the play. Today, we're bringing it all together. So, we have the landscape, barren, isolated. We have this vast, mysterious presence. We have this fear. We have this disorientation. And we know we are utterly on our own in a land that is out to get us. It's the landscape that is out to get us. We have two acts in this play. As you know, Act 1 is set mostly in an interior, domesticated, cultured, cultivated place. Act 2 is outside. So Act 1 is Lillian setting up and creating that sense of order. Act 2 is the destruction of that order. What is Lillian? What does she represent? What does she represent? Britain, Britain British colonization. She represents everything that the British have done to Australia. And all the things that she has with her, the way she sets up a house, the way she treats people, the British class system, for example, um, the lemonade, the sherry, the music box, the visitor's book, the indoor garden, they are all examples of British <coughs> colonization in Australia. And so we see that stability and that order created by Lillian. In Act 2, however, that order is destroyed. The music box only vaguely survives. Visitor's book is gone. Lemonade is gone. The fuchsia, the indoor gardens, they've all gone. And it is the Australian landscape which has fought back, and we're going to see that today. So if you're talking about structure even of a text, and here are just a little tangent, you can talk about the juxtapositioning of the two acts, how the first act sets up the order, the second act destroys the order. You talk about the juxtapositioning of scenes, showing what traditional Australian values are, showing what British values are. But that's another discussion. So, we have the transition from the interior to the exterior location. And we have the destruction of everything that is set up in the first act. We have some foreshadowing of this in the very beginning when Peter sings his song in the first scene. Big Black Jack was always fighting, so they threw him out of the pub. So angry was he that he lit a bit fart and blew the pub apart. This is foreshadowing what happens when you try and suppress and repress something. Because they try to suppress Jack, and it's very significant that it's Big Black Jack, because they try to suppress him and repress him, his anger came out in other ways that had more dire consequences. And this, in the very first scene, foreshadows the ergo poisoning and the fire in Act 2. It foreshadows what is going to happen. And it's a classic example of what you repress will come out bigger, more harmful, more violent, more dangerous than ever before. And that is what Inside the Island is about. It's about the forces of oppression and repression and their consequences. What happens when you try to oppress a people? What happens when you try to oppress a land? Sorry? Yes? Yes, they'll, they'll fight back. They will return and they will return more terrible in, uh, than before in vengeance. And this is what we see with the Australian landscape, and we're going to talk about the gum trees being replaced with what? What are the gum trees replaced with? Ficus and the wheat, yes? And what about the indigenous people? Yes, Trinity. Um, I just had a question. Yeah? Because you know how you said like the fire was the way that the land was fighting back. Could it also have been the, the contaminated wheat? You're absolutely right, and that is what we're going to talk about today. Okay? We are going to get there. So, we're going to see how everything that's been suppressed, you know, whether it's the land and the gum trees or the people, the indigenous people, whatever has been suppressed is going to come back fighting. It's going to re emerge, and there will be dire consequences for, the consequences for those who have done the repressing. So, let's get into it. It is an indictment of colonization, it is a very strong political message. It is, this, this play is a post-colonial text. It is a challenge 
to the old traditional view of colonization, the view which glorified and romanticized accounts of British settlement. Those people who say that Australia was settled, that it became a great nation because of British colonization. This is challenging that view. And it's, we can see this when the land fights back through the fire and as Trinity said, through the wind. <coughs> And we have the strong symbolism of eating and drinking in this play, which supports this fight back. Notice the many references to, eating, to drinking lemonade and sherry, to eating wheat, the number of times wheat is mentioned, eating biscuits, strong emphasis on food and drink. And this is what the play is trying to do. It's showing how humans will write themselves into the landscape. Lillian's and Lillian's father have cleared away the land and instead planted wheat. They've cleared away the gum trees and planted a domestic crop. So whatever was native and authentic and original and genuine about Australia has been done away with. And so Lillian and her family, they represent the repressive and destructive colonization. How colonization is oppressive. They are invaders. They are trying to control what they believe to be an uncultured and uncivilized land. And they're doing it through their fake culture. And how do we know it's fake? Because we are told again and again in the play. Sherry is not an upper class British drink. It is a middle class British drink. It is not a piano which is playing the tune. It is a pianola. The, co the oranges are made of cotton wool. <coughs> Lillian says she doesn't drink, but then drinks the sherry. Everything there is fake. And so, they're in trying to replace what is genuine and authentic to Australia, Lillian has replaced it with something utterly fake. Um, even the planting of the fuchsias and the indoor garden and the wheat and the ficus, it's even trying to control nature. Now you cannot control nature, it's going to fight back. And if we look at things inside the house, that is a very British setup. Outside the house, <coughs> not so much, although we do have the cricket ground and the wheat fields and so on. There's a careful sense of order created in Lillian's house. And this is Lillian asserting the British cultural tradition. Um, we have this pristine uh, land that has been taken over and colonized and made something second rate. And so the wheat fields that have been grown there on the land are inauthentic. They are not genuine. They have been imposed. It's a European farming tradition. It's not Australian. <coughs> and so everything's been imposed on them. The cricket ground is a physical manifestation of British colonization. It used to be an Aboriginal campsite but it's been converted into a, a colonizer's game, into a white game. Cricket, the game of the colonizers. It's no accident that the countries in the world which play cricket today are the ones who were colonized by the British, Australia included. And so it's a kind of white sacred sport replacing what is sacred to indigenous people. And it's the imposition of an absurd and alien culture. And it is no surprise then that the first cracks appear during the cricket match, the return of the repressed. And it's a very transitional scene, the cricket match, because you're moving from what has been civilized and in Act 2, Scene 1, when you've got the ficus and the table set up with the tablecloth and very British picnic setting, and that's what we see at the end, where it's been utterly destroyed. The table turned over, nothing remains. And it's the, as if the imperial center, the imperial rule cannot resist this vengeance and this fighting back of Australia and Australians because the, the Australian landscape reasserts itself and it returns with vengeance. So in Act 1, you've got the drinking, you've got the biscuits, you've got the gold teeth, you've got the tiger and the butter, you've got the beer, you've got the flour, <coughs> all things which are not native to Australia. But in Act 2, you've got human bodies enacting violence. And there's chaos there as, a soldier, as, we, as we view the soldiers' descent into madness and delirium. 
they have actual marks on themselves, they have imagined marks on themselves, they have hallucinations. They're all outward signs of a very complex inner crisis. And this is not unlike World War I, which we will talk about um, a little later. But I want to talk about the land itself. What's happened to the land? They've cleared everything and they've planted wheat. They've written themselves into the land. And so the land itself has been profoundly violated and it's been repressed. And how does it come back? When people eat the wheat because the land has poisoned the wheat, the people eat the wheat and the people show the symptoms of that madness. That's how the land fights back. Is that as if the land is a presence in the plague? It's not something benign. It's something seething under the surface and what, it's, what has been done to it. And so, once again, the wheat that has been planted is poisoned by the land. That poisoned wheat is eaten by the colonizers and that wheat makes them go bad. So, not only is it the land, but it shows the repression of indigenous Australians, those who were slain by the colonizers. And it represents the violence and the injustice and the cruelty and the brutality to the Aboriginal people who were repressed on that land. And it's no coincidence that when they come back and you see the soldiers, they're covered in white flour with black hands and feet with the poisoning. They are like the ghosts of indigenous people coming back to claim what is theirs. There is no indigenous person actually mentioned in this text. But we can always, always feel their presence. They are there. The way they are mentioned, the land being this being there, which is always present, much like picnic at Hanging Rock, can always feel the presence of the indigenous people there, even though we don't meet one indigenous person in the play. Very Australian Gothic. And so these terrible ghosts return to reclaim their space and enact their vengeance. And this is the return of the repressed. And so the soldiers show these signs of a repressed history. And if we link it to World War I, which we'll do later, it also shows the signs of mass warfare and what happens when Australia went to battle for Britain. So it's the land which remembers things. And the land's memory is its strength. The land, the landscape, Australian land, does not forget. It remembers things. And the land produces this infected grain. People eat the grain and the wheat and they become the land in a sense and through them the land fights back. And the soldiers wear these physical manifestations of the repression of the land and the vengeance of the land. And so there's violent chaos. And people have called this um, a hysterical reaction of the land. Now, um, traditionally Hysteria was a product of symbolic displacement. Now you've already done what hysteria is and the history of what it means to be hysterical earlier this year, right? We looked at a couple of things. Now what happens medically when you're hysterical? You have fits, you have spells, you have hallucinations, uh, you, have, you dance around in strange ways and we can see all of these being manifested in the soldiers. So it's as if the land has a body and a psyche. And what is this called? Anthropomorphism. But let's go back and have a look at the indigenous people again because when the British first came here, they declared Australia to be? Terra Nullis. Very good. They completely ignored in the all the indigenous people there, their societies, their cultures, their traditions, their history. And the set was terra nullis. There were acts of terrible brutality, as we can see. And indigenous people were treated little better than animals if they were treated better at all. Many of you will have heard that <coughs> indigenous people were part of the Flora and Fauna Act in the Constitution. Have you heard that? That is actually not true. 
There is no Flora and Fauna Act in the Constitution. That's not true. So while it may not act be technically and officially true, the spirit of it is alive. And we can see that on the tea towel here, where you've got Australian animals, but within the animal is an indigenous person. Salt and pepper shakers. One has an animal, one has an indigenous. So whereas it was not official policy, they were certainly treated as animals. Okay? It's important to know that distinction. Indigenous people were not officially classified as animals or as flora and fauna, but they were certainly treated as them. Trinity. Is that why, like, throughout the play, they don't really say anyone's up, like, um, indigenous, but it's kind of implied some of them are through, like, the way that people Well, we know that the indigenous have always had a very strong connection to land and to country. It's part of them, and they are part of the land. They don't say, this land belongs to me. They say, I belong to this land. And so we can certainly see that their belonging to that land that means that they are part of it. Okay? So they see themselves as that, but this is a bit different. This is actually um, treating them as animals. Yeah, because um, doesn't Lillian call Peter Riffraff? Like what does Riffraff mean? Lower class, uncouth, uncivilized behavior. Okay? This is in the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. And there's a gargoyle of an indigenous person there. The other gargoyles are all belonging to animals. And they've got the indigenous gargoyle there. The others belong to Australian birds, reptiles, mammals, and marsupials. But among them is a gargoyle of an indigenous person. There are two of them. No, it's still there, I believe. Well, it's also part of history now. But yes, it shows how indigenous people were viewed and how they were oppressed. They were placed in reserves. Now, a reserve is generally for animals. Indigenous people were placed in that Aboriginal reserve. It's the name of the place. Okay? So, they were enclosed like animals. So, they were treated as animals. Then we've got the ficus, how the... In, how the land was suppressed. You know that what was native to Australia, these gum trees were removed and the ficus is a plant, very symbolic because why? Mm -hmm. Very invasive roots and I've told you the story about my ficus in a pot. I had a little ficus, left it for a couple of years, went to move it, I couldn't move the pot because the roots had gone down through the very thick pot, shoved the bricks underneath aside and dug deep into the ground. That was just a couple of years. You don't plant, plant a ficus near your, near your house or near a wall because it will destroy it. And that is a symbol for colonization in the play because it is so invasive. Wait, you were trying to grow that in a pot? No, but you get smaller versions as well. But it's just as dangerous here. Yeah. <laughs> you get miniature ones as well. Yes, mine was not quite that size. Okay? And even the poem that Lillian reads out, that she's written on her own, tells us about how they viewed the indigenous people. And again, the repression of the indigenous people. Are we going to analyze that? We can. Because like, I feel like it Okay, well, the very important bits are also the bits that we've talked about, the symbolism of these other objects, but we can. Okay? Everything second grade, the lemonade, the music box, the fuchsias, the pianola, everything second grade there. Authentic Australian stuff replaced with second grade British stuff. Why is lemonade? Well, it's an, it's a, well that is um, a British drink brought to Australia, just like the sherry. Traditional cricket grounds, this one actually shows the trees being bulldozed down to make cricket grounds. These are old cricket grounds. Again, gum trees, red gum trees, I think, replaced with wheat, just as Lillian did. But as Lillian says in the play, the strong forget, the weak remember. Actually, in the play, the weak don't remember, it's the strong who remember because the land remembers. 
And it's very significant in the play that the land sets the fire off. Why is the fire significant in Australian history, in Australian land? What happens to a fire? Caitlin? After a fire is gone through, the roots are able to Absolutely. Australian plants are fairly unique in that sense. Is that after a fire, we have to have controlled burnings. We have to have burnings so the plants come back better and stronger than before. And so that fire that erupts in, inside the island does away with anything that is authentic because that stuff cannot survive in the fire. Like that music box that we have at the end of the last scene. It cannot survive the fire. What can survive the fire is anything that is authentically Australian, that is native to Australia, that is special to Australia. And so that fire, it destroys things, it's very destructive, but it is very cleansing as well. And it gets rid of all the colonizers' influences, and even Lillian is sent away. Yeah. Lillian herself is a very interesting Gothic character. She's not a damsel in distress by any means, but she is very grotesque. She is the monstrous feminine. Perhaps it is an indictment of women who seek power. And you can have very interesting readings on this. That do we that is Naura making a very strong point about what happens when women have power. Or with a feminist reading, can we criticize Naura for showing that a woman who tries to get power is punished? And then how will different audiences react to this? Feminist audience, um, elderly, white, male, middle-aged audience, or a British audience, or an Australian audience? How will different audiences react to this? Trinity. Um, with how you're saying like the fire sending like the way all like the European influences yeah. and all that. Yeah. Could you say by the um the like workers and stuff staying, mm -hmm. they were more like upset, accepting for women? Well, look at the workers. Would you say they're more Australian than Lillian? <coughs> Even George is more Australian than Lillian because the workers have a hard work ethic. They work unlike Lillian. Okay? And especially people like Peter, who's a larrikin, who doesn't need money or wealth or a big home. Okay? He goes with the flow. He's strong. He's masculine, unlike George. Okay? So they are more, far more Australian than Lillian is. Okay? It'll be interesting if a director were to cast Peter and see whether he would cast him as a white person or an indigenous person. And that would be very interesting. I want to come to a little bit about Freud now, because if we're talking about return of the repressed, then we need to know a little bit about Freud. Uh, for literature, this is especially important. For English, it is the meat on your essay. So Freud had a particular theory about repression. He said that particular memories, feelings, desires, or fantasies, which usually have a sexual are pushed out of our consciousness. And the return of the repressed is but these repressed contents seek to emerge into our consciousness some other way, such as in dreams. I would just like to make a quick note about the sexual component there. Um, we know that, or we can surmise that Susan was... What happened to Susan? She was raped. Raped, probably, before she was killed. Now, the landscape or a land is often depicted as being feminine. Look at Mother Earth, for example. So to plant wheat into the land is a violent act and almost an act of which kind of mirrors what happened to Susan. And so we can see how we might call this hysteria or the land fighting back. Now what is the difference between suppression and repression? I just want to make this clear. To suppress something is to, con is to do it very consciously, but to repress something is often very unconscious. There might be certain aspects of a character, like your parts of your id, you want to suppress, <coughs> don't want the world to see. The id is the bit part that needs to be hidden. But that id and the suppressed and the repressed is what will emerge back as well. And so just a final note about hysteria and anthropomorphism. What is anthropomorphism? It is the 
Well, I've got one thing to say to you. D I C T I O N A R Y. Now, from a psychological perspective, we could be witnessing what Jung called an archetypal erosion <coughs> of the collective unconscious or cultural shadow, a classic case of mass hysteria, a small psychic epidemic or a psychogenic contagion. It is, sociologically speaking, a stunning reassertion of the reality of the unconscious with a vengeance. It potentially signals both individually and systematically what, uh, systemically what Nietzsche referred to as a return of the repressed. Now I'm going to put this for you on space as PowerPoint so you don't need to try and copy all that down. Yes, Trinity. It's, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the thing. And what I want you to remember from here, from today's lesson, is how the Gothic genre came to Australian, became the Australian Gothic genre. I want you to think about how genre is used in this text. So you don't just identify the elements of a particular genre, Miller. You identify and you explain how genre is used to convey an idea, to position an audience, to reveal something about the context, to reveal some values or attitudes, to challenge particular ways of thinking, etc. This is the function, the purpose, the role of genre. You never ever say, this is the genre, and leave it at that. You always say, why is this genre here? What is it doing? Analysis equals cause plus effect. Okay? So, the genre perhaps is serving to highlight the indictment of colonization, to de romanticize colonization, to challenge old ways of thinking, to position us to think about things in a certain way, to convey ideas. That is what genre is doing here. And that's how you will take your essay from being at that level to up to that level, if you talk about the purpose and the effect of genre. So make a note of that. The very important scenes in Inside the Island, especially are the scenes in the house uh, in Act 1, Scene 2, uh, when you have the setting up of that order, but also Act 2, Scene 1, when you have the fighters and the symbolism that happens there, and of course all the subsequent scenes where that order is destroyed. There are other things to talk about as well, which we have not talked about today, such as what it says about Australian mateship, whether it is inclusive or exclusive, what it says about corruption in our lives, especially the corruption and hypocrisy of the church, uh, the way we treat the other, such as Higgs and Andy, the marginalized people, um, what it says about class and Victorian no uh, norms. We will talk at another time about um, the significance of World War I and how this uh, is making a comment on World War I even though it is set in 19, 1912 and when did World War I begin? 1914. When did it end? Very good. Just checking. So, to show, so for the questions that talk about Australian identity, uh, what we learn out about Australia or what our, notion, how, what our notions which are challenged you could, it challenges our previously romanticized, glorified notions of colonization. It challenges our view of mateship. We always believe we're Australians, give each other a fair go, very inclusive. It's actually we practice an exclusive form of mateship. The way we treat the other, the marginalized. Um, lots of texts have written about the way we treat the other and the way people are marginalized. <coughs> Even in Archie Wells' story, short stories, for example, he talks about the bitumen on the floor, on the ground, having replaced what was authentically Australian. You will find this in many texts. And studying inside the island and Hanging Rock and other texts like that, you can see how the Australian Gothic genre is perfectly positioned to make a comment about colonization. And you find it used in many, many texts, visual and written that it makes a comment, Australian Gothic genre, because of the way it attacks people who are not used to it, because of the way it disorients people, and the way it, the landscape is so frightening and threatening and isolating, how that is a perfect vehicle to attack traditional notions of colonization. And so, just a little joke at the end. What is the Australian Gothic? Well, in current society, in contemporary society, we all refer to the Prime Minister by the first name. We know them well and they know us 
all of us. We call our Prime Ministers by their first name, don't we? There's a man on the street corner who never leaves, just waiting for a mate, he says. You realise he is on every corner of every street. You are swooped by a magpie in the same place at the same time every single day, and that is true. Uh. It's swooping season, says your neighbour. It has always been swooping season. Again, another thing, magpies, birds, nice birds in Britain, but in Australia they'll come and gouge your eyes out. Sometimes you hear a woman whispering late at night or early in the morning, rage, she says, rage. And here's the best one. The Prime Minister never seems to last long and often disappears through no discernible democratic process. One of them eats a raw onion in an attempt to assimilate. He is gone by morning, replaced by another. That is all, I think. This concludes the lesson on the return of the repressed in Inside the Island. I have provided you documents and articles to read so that your lesson today is substantiated and extended with these sources. You must read these because they contain a lot of information that I have not provided in this lesson. Also remember that when talking about genre, we don't simply list the conventions of that genre. We talk about the function, the role and the purpose of that genre. Why is that genre being used? How is it being used? What is the effect of it? These are the things that will make the difference to your writing and it's very important that you actually think about the effect of that genre and analyze it.